We're talking about f fighting, we're talking about battling, and how appropriate that it happens to be the day when the final announcement goes out for paintballing. Paintballing. I heard a little bit earlier that the teams are going to be made up of the pastors all on one side. <laughs> Y'all don't know what you're getting into. Okay? There's a thing called experience, all right? Perspective, and uh, y'all better watch out. No, I'm, I'm, I think we're going to get whooped. <laughs> no, honestly, we just don't move as quickly as the others. Uh, can I get some of my older brothers to join us? I mean, if I get Ed on board, I feel like we have a little bit of David, you know, I get, uh, anyway, all right. Anyway, looking forward to getting defeated, I guess. But not today, not regarding sin. When we talk about sin, sin sounds, have you, when's the last time you ever heard about sin? When was the last time you heard a sermon about sin? I almost never mentioned that, that three-letter S word. I don't do that, almost. Uh, partly because it doesn't communicate uh, as well. And I, can, I have other, other words to communicate it, like words like idolatry or, or words, oh yeah, that's a hip word, isn't it? <laughs> no, but words that communicate more, uh, more uh, effectively, so... I've done a little bit of that, but really, call sin, sin. Sin is what it is. And so I'm going to define that a little bit, what it means here by lead us not into temptation, what Jesus has in mind. I'm going to define it, sin and temptation. I want to describe that a little bit. And then I want to give you some pathways to avoid falling into temptation, that is, sinning. Okay? So those three things... I want to do with you today, okay? What does, he, what does Paul, what, Paul, what does Jesus mean when he says, lead us not into temptation, when he prays, lead us not into temptation? I just talked about paintballing, and then there's that book that Pastor Dan is going through with you called The Bondage Breaker, which is all about the spiritual battle. That's what this is all about. And so, just providentially, things fall into place, and that's why we pray. Ultimately, our victory over sin is not up to us. We pray to God to give us that victory, the victory that Jesus has already won. Amen? Okay, so that's, that's where we are going with this. We're starting with the sovereign rule of God. We're praying to Him. We're not praying to ourselves. We're praying to Him and praying He that would not lead us into temptation. Now, as soon as I say that, some of, for some of you, not all of you, some of you, a question would go up. Does God ever lead us into sin? And Pastor Dan wanted me to address that. I was going to skip it because I think my solution kind of covers it anyway. But the Bible does say God never tempts you to sin. He never tempts you to sin. He never makes Ezra beat up on his brother Elliot, no matter how stronger, how much stronger Ezra might be. He never does that. God doesn't tempt Ezra to do that. Okay? As unlikely as that might be. Um, what do I believe Jesus is saying? Lead us not into temptation. Don't let us fall into temptation. When, not, don't, not let us avoid temptation. You cannot avoid temptation on this side of heaven. But you are being given tools by God to help you not to sin against Him, not to fall into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. So being led into temptation has to do with Aiden actually going ahead and beating up on Tristan. Do you see? The actual action. All right, Tristan going the other way. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> but you know, so the act actually of sinning, of offending God. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. Basically, it's this Heavenly Father, help me to sin less. I know that, okay, I'm going to come back to this. I know that I'm sinless in Jesus. Say that. I know that I'm sinless in Jesus. Okay. I know I will be sinless in heaven. Say it. I know I will be sinless in heaven. But on earth, help me to sin less. Say it. But on earth, help me to sin less. That's the prayer that you are praying. Help me, Lord, to sin less. I want to honor you. I want to love you with all of my life. Help me to overcome sin because I know that this pleases you. All right. That's the prayer. With me? All right. First then, let me define temptation and sin just a little bit. 
To be tempted is not the same thing as to actually sin, right? To entertain the thought of punching somebody and actually in your mind imagining doing it because you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have enough courage to do it and actually doing it, right? All those things are different, but that thought coming into your mind is not sin in of itself. That's temptation. And do you see, right? Let's do this another way, okay? Um, let's say that you see a... Um, women, I know you struggle with this. You see a fireman calendar, okay? You, you can't help it because it's there. It's advertised on TV. It's going through. So you, so you can't help that come into your mind. But if you start drooling, that's a problem, okay? <laughs> that's a problem. If I say it to the ladies, you men can relate. You know what I'm saying? Right? Okay. Temptation is not sin. Jesus, the Bible says, was tempted in every way as we are, yet he didn't sin. Are you with me? He was tempted in every way as we are, and yet he overcame, and therefore he was tempted worse than any of us ever will be, because he overcame. For us, we are tempted to a certain degree, and we give in. Ah, that's enough. That's my limit, and we sin. But Jesus resisted all the way to the very end. Therefore, he bore the full weight of the sin, of the temptation, and won. So he understands temptation better than any of us ever will. None of you can say, because Jesus never sinned, he really doesn't understand me. No, he understands your temptation better than any of you, and he can deliver you because he has overcome it. Can I get an amen? amen. And that was a cue, by the way, I guess. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, he can deliver you because he has overcome. All right. So what then is sin, technically speaking? All right. You and I were designed to live in a loving relationship with God, live in a oneness with God that experience the oneness and the love that God has enjoyed in, in himself from forever. God is three in one way and one in another way. That threeness is so united and so in love that that threeness is described as oneness, okay? And into that oneness, God pulls us. And we were designed to live in that oneness, to live out that oneness, so that we have our perfect reflection of that perfection, of that oneness for all the world to see. So anything that falls short of or gets in the way of that love relationship with God is sin. Do you hear me? Anything that falls short of that. What does the Bible say? The Bible sa says that sin is lawlessness. That's what we get in, let me see, 1 John chapter 3. Sin is lawlessness. What is the law? It's a perfect reflection of the beautiful character of God. And so when we fall short of that, that is sin. Um, that the Bible talks about missing the mark. That makes sense, doesn't it? And so when anything that we do or any way that we think gets in the way of our love relationship with God, then that's sin. And in that way, sin is, in that, in that sense, sin is idolatry because something is, in, is taking the place where God needs to be in your heart and in your life, where God deserve to be, deserves to be, where you want God to be. Because you see, if you are a Christian, what has Jesus done? Jesus has reunited you in spite of your sin, in spite of the fact that your sin deserves God's condemnation and rejection. Because Jesus bore God's condemnation and rejection, we are one with him. We are united to him, and yet we sin. Yet we do things that get in the way of our love relationship with him. And it's, it's terrible. I remember to a younger crowd, I think, well, it's about the same, same crowd. I, I, I preached a sermon, sin sucks. Sin is terrible. And we hate it because we are believers. We hate it. If we're not believers and we sin, when we do things that are wrong, we have less of a problem. Somebody says, I hate so-and-so. Why do you hate so-and-so? That person looks at you and says, why do you care? <laughs> I just hate so-and-so because I do. I can't help my feelings, that's done. As a Christian, you have the added dimension of struggle saying, I hate so-and-so, and I hate myself for hating so-and-so because as a Christian, I shouldn't hate her, I shouldn't hate him, right? And we have this battle that's going on inside of us, and sometimes we don't know what to do. Are you clear on what sin is? Simply put, 
sin is what gets in the relationship it gets in the way of your relationship with God. And it has all kinds of fruit, sinful fruit in your life. Disintegration, division, all of that. Okay. Nothing tells a story better than examples, right? Nothing illustrates better than examples. Let's take a look at some of them. What, the, the Bible gives us sin lists and see if you can identify with any of these sins and also identify with what the Apostle Paul is telling us about these sins. The Apostle Paul gives us many sin lists. We're going over three. One of them is in the book of Romans and the other, one is going to be, other ones are 1 Corinthians and Colossians. The book of Romans... He talks mainly, he speaks mainly, what, I, what did I say sin was? Anything that distracts you from a loving relationship with God. Okay? With a loving relationship with God. Hey, do you have a friend that always gets, in, gets on your nerves? Do you have somebody like that? Like let's say you're watching TV and your friend is there and on purpose your friend comes and sits right in front of you. Or you can't see, and you move your head. For some reason, he, he's, 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 like, he's got sensors behind his head, and he goes this way. And he blocks you, and he goes that way. And he blocks you, and you, just, ah, 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 you want to choke the person, right? And, and you got that. See, you, you're wanting to see the beautiful image on TV, but this guy, he's getting in the way. That's sin. Do you see? God is the beautiful vision that you want to keep your eyes on, but sin gets in the way. Are you with me? I think that's how the Bible is defining sin. All right. Okay. Romans chapter 1 is a reference to how non-believers, people who are not Christians, um, it's a sin list that applies to non-Christians, okay? Let's go there. Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. Very interesting, the way the Bible, the Apostle Paul describes it. All right. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, uh, uh, landers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boasters, boastful, inventors of evil, dis disobedient to parents, Whoa, what, what? <laughs> okay, so you got in this list murder, strife, deceit, and then you have gossips, and then you have disobedient to parents. All these things fall into the category of sin. Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous degree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Those who do not believe in God do the, all these things and support others who live this way. Can you identify with some of these? Have any of you, have been, have any of you been disobedient to your mom or dad? Oh, yeah. Have you been, had any of these other things? Have you envied somebody? Of course. So all of us fit into this category. Or would have. Look at... Uh, look at um, Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Now this is a list that applies to Christians. How sin, how sin should be looked at by Christians. Right? This applies to non-Christians or Christians, everybody? Christians, just check and make sure you're with me. Okay. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral or idolaters or adulterers or men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Did you catch that? So why does Paul list all of these things that apply to non-believers? Because believers are tempted to live the same way. The believers struggle with these kinds of, the same kinds of temptations to live just like the people in the world. Do you see? Just like a child of the devil. After all, that's what we were in the past. 
But you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how a Christian should look at your own sin, your own struggle with pride, envy, hatred. This is not you anymore. This is a part of the old you. This is a part of the old you that belongs to this world that was nailed to the cross. That's not you anymore. Your true identity is sanctified. You are washed. You are clean before God. But you say, Pastor Paul, you, didn't know, you don't know my past week. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've thought. You don't know what I've said. I don't have to know any of those things. What have you done? Have you cursed somebody? Have you walked away from a relationship and caused a rift in somebody's heart? In the book of, in the book of Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, these people had a, had a truckload of problems. There were divisions inside of the church, people hating one another and dividing over nothing, over nothing. And there was immorality in the church, adultery in the church. Do you know how the Apostle Paul starts the letter to the Corinthians? Saints. <laughs> it blows my mind. He looks at this church with all kinds of problems and says, Brothers, saints, live out what you have become. Live out, express who you are. That's how you are to look at the sin that is remaining in your life. You can identify with these. After all, Paul wouldn't have to, had, to, had to say these things if these people were not struggling with these things. Look at the, this list. It's got all kinds of things. Homosexuality. It's got drunkards, revilers, being mean to one another. You know, some, some other, in the book of Ephesians, do you know this? It's got, it's got bad, coarse jesting, <laughs> rough talk even. There's not a single one of us that can identify with this. But he says to us, who do, who do identify with this, you are positionally righteous in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3. And now, I, I, I picked this sequence on purpose. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and look at how it, it tells us we are to deal with all this stuff that I've mentioned that we still struggle with. Okay? Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. Let me read this. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of all these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked, that's in your past, when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. There it is. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on. You just, you see, yes, you've already put on the new self. This is your identity. You are a saint in Christ Jesus, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. You are, you have already put on the new self, continue to put on your identity, your perfect identity in Jesus Christ. Here, there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Isn't that good? So, you are already in Jesus Christ, new creation. You already have put on the new self. You already are perfectly sanctified. You are Saint. Saint David. Saint David. Saint David. Okay. Saints, guys. In spite of all that we have done wrong before the face of God, in spite of all that we have been guilty for and riddled with guilt over, God looks on us and he says, saints. Let me ask you something. Are you a saint or a sinner, guys? Saint. Thank you so much. Almost always, though, when I do that, one person still says, sinner, <laughs> sinner. You are sinful for sure. 
And you would totally be deserving of God's condemnation if it were not for Jesus. But because of Jesus, your true identity, loved one, is saint. Okay. Grasp that. The theologians call it definitive sanctification. Say that. Definitive sanctification. You've definitively been sanctified, right, in Christ. Experientially, mm, not so much so. And so we struggle. And so there's a battle. And there's a fight. Except some of us are not fighting so much. I want to challenge you today, and I'll spend the rest of this time. Fight. Be committed to the fight of fighting against the remaining sin and the, 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 the propensity to be tempted by sin. Okay? Fight. Learn to pray this prayer. God, let me look more and more like Jesus day by day. I know that I'm perfect in Jesus, but I'm not satisfied with where I am. You know, I, I don't think, um, I, I don't think we face this battle any more, any more strongly for you young people if you become a Christian during your puberty years. Do you hear me? It is then that you are struggling with your identity and you don't know, and it's hard. I know that it's hard. I've been through that. That's when I became a Christian too, in seventh grade or so. But then when I see Given, I've watched Given. I know he struggles with, with stuff going on inside of his heart. I know he can't explain it at times. But he's up here loving the Lord in front of a bunch of people who will watch him. I love that, right in the middle of puberty. And there are many of you here who are saying, I'm going to recognize the fight. I know that my development, the, the development of my body and meeting people is going to pose some problems for me as a Christian. But I'm going to fight. You're not giving in. <laughs> you're not saying, well, that's just natural. You know, it's just natural development of things and you're accepting things. No, you're going to fight. In the middle of that, you're going to fight and you're going to strive to honor God in spite of all the uncontrollable emotions and thoughts that come your way. You're going to say, you're going to stand strong. You're going to represent Jesus and, and love him where you are. I love that. I love seeing that in you young people. It's downright heroic. It's downright Christ-like. I want to encourage you, hang in there, in the fight. But many of us make those kinds of radical commitments throughout college, but then when we graduate college, get into the real world, things seem to kind of cool down. Your religion tends to take a back burner, right? It ends up becoming something of a churchianity, then a vibrant Christianity where there is a certain fight, a bite in it. No. Fight. Fight for holiness. Fight for Christ-likeness. How are you going to do that? How does God answer this prayer, lead us not into temptation? Help me to sin less while I live on this earth. I'm going to give you about four pathways that God uses to help us to deal with sin. Because see, I can't give you everything. This is a thick book. It's a Bible, okay? It's thick. Uh, there are other books. This is a book just on sin, overcoming sin and temptation. It's thick. You say, Pastor Paul, that's not very thick. The writing's small, okay? <laughs> and it's thick. And it gives you all kinds of advice of how to overcome your greed, overcome your pride, overcome all these things, malice, envy, you know, having bitterness toward it. But today, I give you four. I'm just reflecting on this. Pathways that the Lord has used for me personally in many ways have been great helps and I want to give you some help today. Hate sin. First, hate sin. Why do you sin? Hmm? Because you love it. There's a certain release in, in, in sinning, isn't there? There's a certain pleasure in sinning because you love it. The Bible talks about coarse or offensive speech, right? I had a pretty bad mouth at one point, and so I struggled with that, and the Lord delivered me from that between my ninth and 10th grade years. 
But as I was facing ministry, this is, you know, this is like in my college years, I looked at this girl, and I'm sure she never struggled with cursing, bad-mouthing, offensive speech, right? I'm sure she never did, because this is the girl that was always at church. She's the one who, st who stayed around to do the vacuuming and straighten the chairs. She is the, as a matter of fact, she became president of the youth group. But I said to her, why does it feel so good to cuss sometimes? I expected her to totally not be able to relate, to look at me funny and maybe judge me. You know what she said? I know, right? <laughs> That's what she said. I know, right? I'm going, wow, you have a past as well with that, huh? That's right. There's a certain release in that. And we love it. We love our sin, but I want to challenge you to hate it. I want to give you some, some reasons to hate your sin. First, I want to challenge you to hate your sin because it enslaves you. Because it enslaves you, and it's a terrible taskmaster. You should be subject. You should be under only one person, and that person is God. You cannot be your own master, and your sin cannot be your master. Your master must be God and God alone. Sin is wicked, and sin is evil because it distracts you from your relationship of living under the loving lordship of God. You end up living under the, under, under, under the evil terrible, oppressive lordship of your sin. Ask anybody, all kinds of addictions. I mentioned, you know, my obsessive compulsive uh, um, inclination, right? I have to have things a certain way. If I am oppressed by that, that is my idol, too. Do you see what I'm saying? That is my sin that I need to overcome. Ask any person struggling with their addiction, with any, any, any of the uh, anonymous groups. Ask them if it's a pleasure to be in that sin. It's not. They're terrible taskmasters, right? Beating their slaves into submission until eventually they can't move because they're dead. It enslaves you. The thing is, um, why is smoking bad? Huh? Why do we call smoking a sin? Is it because, is it because it's, it's harmful for your body? I know young people may be thinking about smoking too um, and things. Why, why, why do, as a Christian church, why do we think, that, you need, this needs to be clear to you. I, I really do. You can't just say, oh, because it's a bad habit and people look down on me if I do it and it just doesn't fit into Christian. No. It's because um, the Bible doesn't even talk about tobacco at all. Oh, that means I can try it. No, okay. <laughs> the Bible doesn't talk about it. And you say, well, it's harmful for the body. Well, a lot of people say coffee is bad for the body. And we serve coffee like, I, I encourage you to drink coffee so you'll stay awake when I'm preaching to you, okay? All right. So why the double standard? Because it's in general, smoking tends to be addictive. It tends to rule your life. Do you know how expensive it is? And people still smoke. Do you know how terrible those commercials are against smoking? And people still smoke. Have you seen some of those? Some of those? I saw this one. It's, it ranges from funny to just horrific. And the worst one that I've seen was a person who had cancer. Okay, he, shed, he had cancer, and because of the cancer, a part of his trachea had to be taken out. And so he was breathing through a hole in his neck, and he was smoking through that hole in his neck. Huh? <laughs> really? <laughs> really? See, the, the, the bad thing about smoking is that it takes control over something over which only God should have control. We even go, so, so what about coffee? If I'm addicted to coffee, is that an idol? Yes. It's an idol that you need to deal with. Sure. The list can go on and on and on. Every person is going to be different. But what tempts you to take the place where God needs to be? It will enslave you. That's what sin does. Hate it. It distracts you. By doing that, by becoming your master, it distracts your gaze from your true master, Jesus. As a Christian, don't you love him? Isn't he beautiful? When th those things get in your way, don't you kind of, shouldn't you dislike it? If you're watching your favorite TV program and somebody gets in your way, what happens? This person gets on your 
nerves. It's like the last nerve that you got and the person doing the river dance on top of it. Because ah, you want to do something about it. That's how it should be with your sin because you want to look at Jesus. You want to reflect his likeness. But this sin, this hang up, this addiction is getting in the way of that. That's what makes it so evil. And I want to see Jesus. See, it's motivated positively. So it hates sin. It distracts you from him. Sin lies. Sin lies about you. The sin lies about... Look, I was reading this, this part of this book. And this tells, is telling you what you are. What you are in Jesus Christ. Not on your own. In Jesus. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Hang in there. I am God's child. I am Christ's friend. I have been justified. I am united with the Lord and one with him in spirit. I have been bought with a price. I belong to God. I am a member of Christ's body. I am a saint. I have been adopted as God's child. I, I have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. I have been redeemed and forgiven of all of my sins. I am complete in Christ. And sin tells you you are none of these. I am secure. I, have, I am free from condemnation. I am assured that all things work together for good. I am free from any condemning charges against me. I cannot be separated from the love of God. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. I am hidden with Christ in God. I am confident that the good work that God has begun in me will be perfected. I am a citizen of heaven. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I can find grace and mercy in time of need I am born of God and the evil one cannot touch me isn't that good continues to say again sin tells you that you are none of these I am significant I am the salt and the light of the earth after Jesus who is the salt and the light I am a branch of the true vine, a channel of his life. I have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. I am a personal witness of Christ's. I am God's temple. I am a minister of reconciliation. I am God's co-worker. I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. I am God's workmanship. I may approach God with freedom and confidence. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When your sin, when your greed, when your pride overwhelms Overwhelms you and you give in to that temptation it says you can't do anything without that sin it lies to you it lies to you the Bible says that you are a child of God and the sin will tell you no you are a child of the devil when do you doubt your salvation when you are caught in the grip of a habit you cannot give up a well, familiar sin right it lies to you and Jesus says to you that you are a treasure to be cherished while your sin will tell you through your guilt you are trash to be discarded who are you listening to who are you listening to sin lies sin lies not only to you but it lies about Jesus it tells you that Jesus is not enough but he is and that Jesus is not pleasing enough but he is he is the greatest pleasure and he is the happiest of all. And to give up on him is to give up on life itself. Sin lies and sin kills you. Sin will kill you. That's what James says. James 1 verse, 5, verse 15 tells us that greed gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. Sin will kill you. If you continue the pathway of sin and you, and you harden your heart and you say, well, God will forgive me anyway, or I can't help this, I, I'm going to give in. And then if you do this, your heart becomes hardened and you realize in the end, you never truly believed in Jesus at all. When that happens, then you've abandoned the faith because there was no true faith in the first place. It kills you. Also, even as Christians, even as Christians, sin kills you in the, make, in, the, in the sense that it makes you ineffective. You know, John Piper, when he first became a pastor of Bethlehem Baptist, which, which pastor he kept for over 30 years, when he first be, went, went there, he almost got fired. <laughs> he almost got fired because he, he wrote an article on sexual addiction. And so people had a big problem with that, and they almost fired him. But his burden was this. Because of certain youthful addictions, 
Whereas young people would commit their lives to a lifetime of ministry, they give up on it because they feel so gripped by their sin. And he wrote this article, a rich article of empowerment to overcome sin and to glorify God in all your relationships. Okay? All right. So the first one is hate sin. Second one is kill sin. If you hate it, then kill it. Don't put up with it. Kill it. Win. When we play paintball this coming weekend, win. Destroy the enemy, even if he is your... Pa yeah. Okay, get him. All right? He's in your sight. Get him. Knock him down. Okay? And uh, hope that he doesn't push off the paint and keep on going. I'm just kidding. I heard that somebody else good. Anyway, all right. Moving on from there. Enough paintball analogies today. It says this. Put to death the sin that remains inside of your life. And kill it. Know that there is a battle going on. There is a fight going on. Fight with all your might. Can I get an amen? Fight with the might that God gives to you. Because there is victory. There is power for victory. Let me show you this picture really quickly here. The person on your left, on my right, your left. That's right, I did that right, okay. On your left is Ronda Rousey. She was undefeated in MMA, Ultimate Fighting Championship, for 12 fights, okay. The person next to her is Holly Holmes. Holly Holmes. Holly Holmes defeated Ronda Rousey uh, this last time. Holly Holmes is known as the preacher's daughter, okay? And it turns out her father really is a preacher. Now, Ruthie is taking some martial arts, <laughs> but I hope she never goes in this direction. <laughs> but anyway, um, so imagine this though. I mean, Rhonda, the contrast is stark. She is, Rhonda, she is, <laughs> Holly, Holly uh, Holmes is known as the gentlemanly fighter. She is, she is considerate. And even after she pounded uh, Rhonda Rousey, she had concern for her and she was going to go out to her and reach out. Rhonda, on the other hand, is bad, okay? That's her, that's her thing. That's her gimmick thing. Um, she almost picked a fight in the very beginning when they got, anyway, and then, and then you know how you're supposed to touch gloves in the beginning? Holly Holmes went like this, Ronda Rousey left her hanging, okay? She went back like that. Now, if, imagine Holly Holmes got into the ring and the bell rang, you looked at Holly and she was still putting on the gloves. And she said to Ronda, oh, wait, wait just a second. Do you think Ronda would have waited? No. Holly would have been annihilated, okay? This is the smithereens. What's my point? The time to put on your gloves is not in the middle of your fight, okay? So kill sin before it finds expression. Do you understand what I'm saying? Kill sin before it finds expression. When it finds expression in your life, when you give in to the temptation, it tells you that there is a problem. So now you can deal with it. And then you go back to the locker room and you get on your knees and you deal with it. For instance, if I am dealing with my family and I blow it with the person that I love a lot, and I just, just I feel something coming up inside of me, I take a break and walk away. I retreat into the lo locker room and I ask the Lord, what is this about? Do I have too much pride in me? Where is this bitterness coming from? And I deal with it. And I can apply God's word to my heart and to my life and I kill that sin that still remains inside of me. That's what we must do. I don't always do it. I don't do it consistently. But I'm challenging you to be committed to it. Kill sin. Kill it. When you have the opportunity, when we are in a group like this, know that you are in the battle. The best place to prepare for the battle is in a room like this or in your homes, on your knees before the Lord. Process your negative emotions before God and your temptations and know that it's worth the fight. Also, when you fight, kill sin. Kill your own sin. 
It's so easy to kill somebody else's sin. Oh, that person has problem with pride. He's so prideful. Oh, and that person, oh, she's a gossiper. Or he's gossiping all the time, talking about other people. You know what I mean? Right? <laughs> right? And so we, we're so pro at killing the sin in other people, but we relax when it comes to killing the sin in us. Oh, I'm human. Oh, come on, right? We all mess up sometimes. Come on, let's stop rationalizing it. As someone has once said, make war. Fight. It's worth it. You know what the best way to win is? Just to die. <laughs> Just die to that sin and that temptation. See yourself as crucified with Jesus Christ, as wearing that righteousness of Jesus. When your husband just doesn't understand you, when your wife is dancing on that last nerve, kill that nerve. Die to yourself. Die to that pride. Know that you've been nailed to the cross with Jesus. And if that's the case, the devil will have no power over you. Right? If you kick a dead man, does he feel it? Uh, do you remember, the, remember I told you the story of the cadaver that, that was being experimented on where the fingernails fell off and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the medical student panicked and, and wanted to leave the place, but the corpse did nothing, okay? So the best thing to do, best way to defeat sin really is just to die to it, to see that you are already dead in Jesus Christ. Die to it. It is so worthwhile. You can say to, to the temptation, keep on walking because you're talking to a dead man. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay. It's worthwhile. Let me give you just a couple more real quick. This one's important. Look to Jesus. When you fight your sin, look to Jesus. Jesus is more precious than anything in the world. When you love him, it pushes out your desire to sin. Somebody talked about this. There's an expulsive power to a preferred affection. You have a certain amount of time, and when you fill it with the things that you want, other things cannot get in there. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you love Jesus, and he is the the opposite of all of your sin, your sin continues to get pushed out. And the more that you are satisfied with him, the less the attraction those distractions will have in your life. So fall in love with Christ over and over and over again. This Christmas season, see Jesus. Look with me. See Jesus who from all of eternity, think with me, Jesus God, he's enjoying the praises of thousands and tens of thousands of angels and, and, and the adoration of his heavenly father in the embrace of the Holy Spirit. And he leaves all of that behind to come and to, and to be born in the muck and the mire of the manger. He comes to the lowest place possible so that the people who are at the lowest place possible might come to him. Shepherds who were looked down on that, in that society were able to access Jesus, the king of the universe, look how beautiful he is and how dirty and filthy everything else that might get in the way of that is. Look at Jesus' perfect life. Look at how he lived perfectly. Look at how he did not envy anyone. He did not hate anyone, but he sacrificially gave his life for everyone. Look how courageous he was in the face of the people that were opposing him. See how different he is from all the sin that you and I live in. But then, see him give that perfection to you. The Bible says that you wear his righteousness, his perfect life. And when you're overcome with guilt, look at your sin nailed to the cross. Look at your sin tearing flesh from bone on Jesus' body. Really, is the temporary pleasure of your sin worth that? Will you love this world that crucified your Savior? No! And you preach to yourself and say, it's not worth it. It's not worth dishonoring the God that I love and this Jesus who has done so much for me. And you stick to the fight. And by his grace, you win. See Jesus who goes to the grave and dies your death and he rises again from the grave and brings you your resurrection. 
And in that resurrection power, there is power to overcome all of your struggle and all of your trying circumstances and every fight that you have with the indwelling sin that still remains. There are all the resources of that. The Holy Spirit is life creation, creating new creation power that created everything out of nothing. And you have that power. You can overcome your sin. You can overcome your pride. You can overcome your feelings of envy. I know they feel like they've got such a grip on you that you can do nothing but sin, but they, they are very limited in their power. Jesus has already overcome. Look to him. Whatever deeds or thoughts that invade you, be committed to the fight. Look to Jesus and overcome. I've challenged you today to hate sin, to kill it, that looking at Jesus, it makes everything that would get in the way of knowing him look like dung. Look like what, everybody? Dung. What, everyone? You know what that is? Yeah. In Korean, it's dung. It's dung. It's what it is, all right? And it's dung. And in the Greek, it's pig intestines, all right? It's, it's, it's nasty, all right? for the Jews especially. Anything that would get in the way of your relationship with God, even good things, is dumb compared to that. All sin, no matter how much pleasure you've derived from it in the past, oh, I've got to get justice for me, and you get justice and it feels good for a little while, all of that is dumb compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus' mercy and forgiveness and experience. Can I get an amen? So avoid sin, because it's dirty. Let me give you one more insight. Don't be afraid of sin. Don't be afraid of sin. If you're not a Christian, you should be afraid of sin. I have nothing comforting to tell you. I cannot tell you that you are a child of God, because you're not. And everything that sin tells you is true. And the guilt that you feel is real. I can't tell you any, 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 anything else. But I can give you the resolution that God gives to us here because in Christ you have all the resources to overcome all of the sins and the temptations that are in you and around you and so finally trust the gospel trust in the gospel know that Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith look at Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 13 everything that I've said is right here look at this with me and I'm done ready Ready? Get set. Read. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which hangs so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see how all of that is in here? Hating sin, looking to Jesus. Jesus, the author and finisher, author and perfecter of your faith. Your salvation ultimately is not up to you, loved one. God will complete it in you. And I want to challenge you to, to, you to do your faith, live and walk your faith in the confidence that God will finish what he started. In the confidence that God is not a quitter. That God knew what he was doing when he chose you and called you and made you his own. He knew what he was doing in spite of all the sin that you have committed. He knew all that. You could never surprise him. And he says, I'm going to finish what I started in you. Trust in the work of the gospel. Let's pray.